but we also offer prayer. We offer three times a week uh, of prayer that if you can join us, it's a it's a prayer um, it's a prayer room, and we always make an announcement and let you know. And you just go to to the Fresh Strength page, and it's kind of like a Zoom call. It's kind of similar to that. And that way, you're not on the actual page. It's a little more um, intimate, a little more private. And you can come on and we can pray for you or you can pray. And, you know, if you're a prayer warrior and you love to pray, this is a good opportunity for you to be part of the group. And we have our prayer times um, every Wednesday at 430 in the afternoon. That's Central Standard Time, Wednesday, 430 Central Standard Time. And then Thursday mornings at 6.30 a.m., that's in the morning time. That's in case we have to get up and have their prayer time before they get off to work or get started with the family or what have you. And then Friday, we have uh, at 11.55, so that's right before noon. And then all central stands. Um, so if you are going in and you want to be part of the and this is a great for you. Like I said, and we always have prayer. We need prayer. Uh, we just, we're not going to without uh, being covered in prayer. So we appreciate y'all. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and get started with our teaching. And just in case you're new, because we have been getting a lot of new people. So in case you're new and you're not real sure what we're studying right now, Right now, we are studying, and I know this is going to be backwards, but at least you can kind of see the picture. But it's uh, it's Leif Hetland's book, Call to Rain. And then its last subtitle is Living and Loving from a Place of Rest. And this old book has really ministered to me more than, than I think any we've done in a while. I mean, me personally. It's just been a real... And if you don't have one, it's not too late to get it. You can still get it and study it. And I usually get all my books, the ones I know I'm going to use a lot. I get them from the bookstore. You can go, if y'all have an Office Depot close by or anything that's uh, similar to that, you can go. And we have a local bookstore, too, called uh, Sir Speedy. And I get my books spiraled uh, on the end. easier to turn the pages back, but... I haven't had a chance to go and get this one done, and all you know, my book's falling apart. <laughs> I've used it so much that I folded it back so much until the pages are all coming out of it already. I don't think that's a manufacturer problem. I think it's just that I've underlined and highlighted and just and reading and studying in this book. So I see all my pages. I have at all got all the highlights. Really, really good book don't have the book, I really recommend it. It's been a really great book. And so we're studying this book, two chapters. And we're already on chapters 9 and 10. And that's what I'm going to teach out of today is 9 and 10. Chapter 9 is called Children of Inheritance. Children of Blessing. And he's got the book broken down into four. Inheritance and then destiny, and we are in the third section already. We're in inheritance, so we're learning what it's like to be one of the king's kids. And when you're one of the king's kids, then um, guess what? We have an inheritance. We have an inheritance coming to us. But we're going to talk a little bit more in depth about that uh, today. So. If you have your book handy, I'm going to be using my book a lot, of course, in the Word. And I've got my scriptures. If y'all want to get the scriptures ready, it's going to be um, 2 Kings 2, 1 through 10 are my verses I'm going to use today. And I'll Cheryl, there's Cheryl, my buddy Cheryl. I'm glad to see you. At Hebrews, just Hebrews 11, 21. And that's a good at any time is in the faith chapter with prayer and then I'm going to get straight into this Father God we thank you so much for the opportunity Father God we thank you for the ladies with the desire to uh, to know your word that they would get up in the mornings those that are here live Father God that they would be here up early and 
whatever their situation is, their family situation, they can can hear your word, Father God, and so they can learn about their inheritance. And we thank you. So we'll be watching later, or maybe even on YouTube. Father, we thank you for these um, for these uh, wonderful people that you have sent. I just ask that your word would encourage them. We ask, Father God, the Holy Spirit would seal seal them, saying anything whatsoever that would not glorify you, that would not be scriptural, Father God. And I just ask, Father God, your blessings on the teaching this morning and the blessings on each and every. A uh, person who will hear this message, Father, and I just ask that it would be a message that will draw them closer to you, Father. And Father, we just love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So we're going to get started. So in chapter 9, on uh, page 199, this just really, really, this was the very first page in, in our chapter 9 book. He was talking about, Life was talking about Elijah. And if y'all are like me, I have a hard time, or used to have more of a hard time trying to remember Elijah and Elisha. I thought, now which one was which? Which one was the one that had the the bigger portion? And, all? and I mean, this is so simple. And y'all might already know this or might do it, but <clears throat> the way I figured it out was Elijah start has J in it. Hey, Miss Stephanie, glad to see you this morning. Uh, Elijah, the first Elijah, one he had, his name starts with, has a J in it, Elijah. So, after him came Elisha. Elijah is the one that did not die here on earth, and he, um, into uh, so, uh, Elijah is the one that uh, starts with the J, has a J doesn't start with the J but has a J in it. But he was Life was talking about Elijah and Elisha, and I, this was I just love how no matter how many years you study the Word, no matter how much you know you feel like you know or you know there's so much more still to be learned. And I never caught this before, and I thought it was so interesting that Elijah brought up here on page 199. He says, when Elijah was about to be taken up into heaven, Elisha followed him from city to city and would not leave his side. When the two crossed the Jordan and Elijah was prepared, preparing for his dramatic exit from this world, he said to Elisha, tell me what I can do for you before I am taken from you. The only thing Elisha asked for was a double portion of Elijah's spirit. Elijah told him that was a hard thing. The power Elijah had walked in had cost him a lot. Nevertheless, the, the request was granted. So when we we go to actually to the scripture, and when you read um, starting in verse 1 in chapter 2, you see that Elijah went to... They went to Gilgal, and then they went to, uh, let me see, they went to Gilgal, which life says that circumcision took place. But each one of them noticed it before. Elijah gave Elisha opportunity to either stay put or go back. He said, I'm going to Gilgal, you stay here. And every single time, Elisha said, no, if you go, I'm going with you. And they went to Gilgal, which is where Israel's circumcision took place. Now, if y'all know anything about circumcision, that's not an easy <laughs> task for men, especially for grown men. So this was a place of pain and suffering. Gilgal was. That's where the circumcision had taken place. After. Then they went to Bethel where Jacob had experienced an open heaven by resting on a rock, even though he did So this was a time, a hard time for Jacob. This was the place where Jacob went, and he had to lay. This is where he learned to lay his head on the, on the rock. Can you think about that? Rock. Jacob below. Oh, but I like to be when I'm going to try to sleep. 
And I sure don't want to pick up a rock to use for a pillow. I mean, that just does not sound at all. But yet, that's what Jacob ended up doing. He used a rock for a pillow. But that actually represents that he was resting on the rock. Even on something that was not comfortable. Even if that's something that it would have been hard, literally hard, to lay his head on. But he laid his head on that rock. And that was where he learned how to rest because that rock represented Jesus. It represented the, the Lord Jesus Christ, even back in the Old Testament. So uh, Bethel was also a place of uncomfortableness. But whenever Elijah gave Elisha again, gave him opportunity and told him, you can stay here. And he said, no, wherever you go, I will go. Elisha said here in verse 2, as surely as the Lord lives and you yourself live, I will never leave you. So Elisha was, was, was proving his commitment. He was proving that he was willing to go to the, to the difficult places with Elijah. He didn't have Elijah go by himself. He was willing to go with him. And it says they went to Jericho, where Israel was first tested and battled in the promised land, and their hearts were tempted. Elijah had been through many tests. Though he had freely received an inheritance, he had paid a price for the maturity required to steward it. Elisha was willing to suffer the cost as well. We receive, he received a double portion because he knew what a double portion implied, that he would be honoring and stewarding an inheritance for his generations and the ones to follow. And I had never thought about that, y'all. That is just, that's so rich because whenever, um, whenever Elijah told him that this was going to be a hard thing. It was going to be a difficult thing when he, Elisha asked for a double portion. I just always took that as, do you realize how hard it's going to be? Miracles as I did? Because that's what he was asking. Many, many miracles. Elisha was asking to do twice as many. And I always took that as to mean that Elijah was telling him, that's going to be a hard thing I have to do to to match up to what I've done and then to double them. But what he was actually saying was, and I, after I saw this, I went back and I researched it some, what he was actually not saying that it was necessarily a hard thing for him to do, but he was telling him, it's a big responsibility. Do you know how he was telling him it was gonna be hard for Elisha? It's, it's a hard thing because there's the more responsibility we have, the more we're given in the kingdom, or in anything really, the more responsibility that there is. And he says here, um, people today, people ask for a double portion pretty casually. I've had people come to me and say they wanted a double portion of the power, wisdom, or love that I'm walking in, but they do not understand the relational elements, the identity and the intimacy that I have fought for and learned first. So ladies, we do ask for a double portion. We do ask. We want to have all that God has for us. But when we ask for that, we have to realize that there is responsibility that comes with it. And there is a price to pay. Salvation is free. We, when we repent and we're with a sincere heart, and if you have not made that commitment and you have not given your heart to Christ yet, I always like to give opportunity for that. That's the first step. If you haven't Leif talks about the three chairs. If you haven't read the book, haven't really gotten into it, or don't have a book yet, and you haven't been in our studies, I really went into the three chairs pretty in depth in my last teaching. And you can go back and uh, get all of our teachings. You can get uh, Jennifer at a wonderful teaching last time. You can go back on the Fresh Strength page and you can see the other teachings before this one. But in the three chair principle, if you're new to the group or if you're new to the book and the study and you haven't heard this before, I love the principle that Leif uses in the book of the three chairs. And chair three, he doesn't really talk about much in the book, but he just explains what it is. Chair three is someone that's in the world and lost and not even a Christian yet. 
So everybody is sitting in one of three chairs. You're sitting in chair one, chair two, or chair three. If you're in chair three, we need to take care of that. That's the most, most important thing because if you're sitting in chair three, you're living in the world. You're living completely for yourself. You're not even in the kingdom yet. And so that's the first thing. If you have not given your heart to Christ, I would tell you to stop what you're doing right this second and make that right first because you're not going to be in either one of the other two chairs if you are sitting in chair three. But chair one, he said, he said, we're all sitting in one of these two chairs and I'm not going to go in depth in them because like I said, we've already done that in some of the previous teachings. But chair one operates out of faith and out of love. And chair two operates out of fear and out of self. And if you are a Christian, now both of those chairs are people that are saved and that belong to Christ, they belong to the kingdom. But if you're in chair one, you're still operating in a lot of fear. You still, um, you still have doubts. You don't have very much faith. But if you, and we all, all of us at one point or another, we tend to slip back over into chair two occasionally because of circumstances and because of things that may be going on in our life. And we slip back into fear and we slip back into doubt. Uh, maybe, you know, when something catastrophic happens in your life, uh, you know, just there's so many things. A divorce happens, a death, especially a death of someone close to you. Maybe someone you've been praying for for years and um, you just, you knew for sure that they were gonna be healed and but then instead they pass away. Uh, financial problems, uh, having a prodigal son or a prodigal daughter or a prodigal husband. Uh, anybody that you love and they're not living for the Lord and, and you're just, you know, uh, that's heavy on your heart. Any of these search situations can cause us to slip back into chair two. But once we recognize it and we, we read this book and uh, it's just, I love the, his imagery of it. It's just wonderful. But chair one is when you've moved over into faith and when you know who you are. Life talks a lot about identity in this book. We have to know who we belong to. When you fully understand that you belong to Christ, then you're over in chair one. And I didn't even realize till Jennifer brought it up in her teaching last week that on the very last page of the book, well, page 320, that there is a list and he's got uh, what chair one and then on the other side chair two what the contrast are and he says chair one you live in kingdom of God and chair two you're living in the kingdom of self uh, chair one is love based and ch chair two is fear based uh, chair one is rooted in the spirit of sonship and chair two is rooted in the orphan spirit and it just goes on down and tells you uh, lives uh, Chair one lives from God, and chair two lives for God. There's differences in this. There's differences in the level of your maturity. And I love how he said that, because I've heard even people, uh, I've heard Joyce Myers say so many times that she's had so many people write into her or come up to her after um, one of her, um, um, when she goes to minister, and they'll say, Man, I wish I had a ministry like you. I mean, you know, I'm working really hard to have a huge ministry just like you have. Or what's the secret? You know, what do I need to do? to? Because I want to have a ministry just like you. And she said when people ask that, she said, I know they have no clue what it cost me to have this ministry. Because she said, I didn't just wake up one day. Not that God can't do it this way. He can do it however he wants. But he doesn't get just like our children. We don't give our kids. We may have as parents that love our children. And when we know we belong to Christ, we know that he is our father. And the, the, cat, the cattle on a thousand hills belong to him. He has everything that we need. And if we know him, and if we understand his love for us, we know that all that we need is available. Excuse me, but sometimes he doesn't give it to us right away because he knows we're not mature enough for it yet. And it's just like if we have a car, I may have a, a really nice car that, you know, I've bought it and I've set it aside for one of my children for whenever they get ready to drive. 
but I'm not going to let them drive that car until they're mature enough. I'm not going to give them the keys to a car when they don't even know how to drive yet or when they haven't even shown me that they could make up their bed without being asked to do it, you know, 10 times or whatever. According to the maturity level is how much freedom I'm going to give that child and how much I'm going to do for them because I love them, not because I don't want them to have it. I want my children to grow up and to have nice things and to have the things that, that they need to make it in life. But sometimes, you know, people that are rich, people in the natural that are rich, and they just give their kids just anything and everything they want, it's really not good for them. It really hurts them in the long run because they don't know how to take care of it. And sometimes it ends up causing them to have um, marriage problems. It can cause them to have, um, you know, if you gave them, just using a car as an example, but if you gave a teenager a car that could do 200 miles an hour, and you just gave them the keys and they're only 17 or 18 years old and they haven't really proven their driving skills you know well yet and they haven't proven that they can keep curfew and what have you and they're rebellious but you give them that car anyway just because you know they want it it could actually cost them their life or it could cost someone else their life if they get out and they're irresponsible with that and so we don't realize what it costs the maturity and the maturity level that God is looking for is us spending time with Him. When we go through the hard times, I know I've had people say, oh, I wish I had this that you have, or I wish I had, I wish I could have the peace that you have. Well, I went many, many, many years. I mean, I was in my 30s, actually my late 30s, and I had been through many trials and many hardships. I mean, starting even from the time as a child. I mean, my father left when I was uh, three years old. We didn't know where he was at for many years till I was a teenager. And then he rejected my sister and I even then. And we didn't have, still didn't have a relationship with him again until I was probably, in, well, I was, um, I was in my late 20s whenever I finally had a relationship at, at all with my father and it was still never a good one but that I had been through a, a bad marriage I had been through divorce I had been through issues with my children I had been through financial issues I mean many many but and some of y'all if y'all follow me on Facebook you may have heard some of my stories of faithfulness because God was faithful but he was growing my faith and it cost it cost me a lot <laughs> trust me and um, I was going through one of the hardest times ever. I was going through a really bad marriage, and uh, I was just crying out to God. And he said, and I told him, I said, Lord, I said, how many years am I going to have to call out to you for peace? But I knew that his word said, I knew that God's word said that he died for my peace. And I knew that he said that he would give me the peace that passes all understanding. And I remember I was driving down the road and I was just crying, just tears coming down my face. And I was just begging the Lord, what is it gonna take? You know, I've tried to do everything I feel like you told me to do. I've read your word. I've, I've tried to stay close to you and do what you would have me to do. I've spent time with you. You know, I'm like, I've paid my tithes. You know, I mean, I'm just going down my little checklist of all my things that I've done. You know, and I just feel like I've been faithful and I love you, but, but when am I ever gonna have peace in my life? And the Lord told me in my spirit, he just spoke to my spirit, and he said, you're driving towards peace right now. Just keep going. Just keep moving. I'm giving you And it was just like the spirit of peace. It was like a spirit. It was like something I'd never had before. It just washed over me. And I just cannot even explain it unless you've ever been through it. But I'm telling you, that came out of one of the hardest times of my whole entire life. I felt like my whole world was collapsing. I mean, I was having marriage trouble, finance trouble, uh, the problems in my body. I was having fibromyalgia issues and my shoulders were hurting all the time. And, and I was having some problems with one of my children and I was just like, Lord, you know, how much is one person gonna have to take? I just don't understand, you know, I'm supposed to be your child and why does it, I feel like I'm just always being punished and I just couldn't understand it. But I'm telling you, when he gave me that peace, 
and not that I haven't faced hard times since then, because I have. I've had issues since then. We all have. I've had relational issues. I've had, um, you know, I've had plenty of problems. I've had the world. We all live in the world. But I'm telling you, ever since that day, I just... I always know that things are going to work out. I don't know how, and my thing I always say, Lord, I don't know how you're going to work it out. I don't know when you're going to work it out, but I know you're going to work it out. That I know. I know that because I know you, because I know God. I know his character. I know that my character is not faithful. My character is weak. My character wants to give up and wants to just throw in the towel a lot of times and just say, forget it, I don't want to do this anymore. But then I look to him and I know that, I know his character, I know what the word says about God. He has proven himself to me so many times. And I think about Moses whenever the word says that the children of Israel knew God's acts, but Moses knew his ways. And ladies, there's a huge, huge difference between knowing God's acts and knowing his ways. And <clears throat> it costs something for that. Whatever you're going through right now, you may be going through a hard time. You may just be crying out to God right now and just saying, when, oh Lord, when is this ever going to be over? I just can't go another footstep. I can't make it. I can't even breathe. I'm just, there's so much going on. I just physically don't feel like I can even take another breath, much less another footstep. But when you're going through that, ladies, don't give up. Don't throw in the towel. Look to God's Word and ask Him. Get in. Um, just snuggle up with Him. Just snuggle up close to Him and just ask Him for His presence and just spend time with Him no matter what's going on. And I'm telling you right now... <laughs> You will learn who you are in Christ, and you will learn who he is. And that was the thing with Elisha and Elijah. Elisha had proven that he could handle it. He was up to the task. He could have given up at any time. He didn't have to go to Gilgal. He didn't have to go to Bethel. He didn't have to go to Jordan. He didn't have to go to these places. But yet he chose to do that, even though it wasn't easy. And because he made these difficult choices and he stayed with the prophet of God, he stayed with God's man who represented the presence of God in, for that time frame. Because of that, God honored his wish. His, God honored his desire. And he did. Although we see that Elisha went on and he did do twice as many miracles as, um, as Elijah did. And I wanted to, um, let me see. And then he went on, he was talking about Jacob when he said, um, he talked here about Jacob, but then he went on again and he talked about Jacob again. And he said, I just love how he brought all this out with Jacob. This is on page 205 of our book. And it says in Genesis 28, 10, 12, it says, as Jacob journeyed to his father's homeland, fleeing his brother's anger, God gave him an open heaven encounter as he rested on a stone, and Jacob became aware of the Father's presence. He became aware of the Father's presence while he was in an uncomfortable situation. If you remember Jacob, if you're familiar with him, you know, he started out, Jake, the name Jacob means deceiver. Remember, Jacob didn't know who he was in Christ. He knew what he wanted, but he didn't have the maturity yet. He had not been through the trials. He had not given God opportunity to prove himself to Jacob. So Jacob tried to grab everything for himself. Even when he was still in the womb, he showed his own personal character of grabbing the heel of his twin brother. His twin brother was the oldest and should have had the double portion. He should have had the bigger part of the inheritance. He should have had the blessing. But Jacob started grabbing at it even when he was still in his mother's womb. And we see Jacob, as he gets older, he's still following that same pattern. He's trying to grab. He's not waiting for God to give him the blessing. He's going to use trickery, and he's going to trick his dad, his mom and his dad. I mean, his mom, Jacob and his mom go into cahoots together, kind of, to trick um, Isaac and, and also to trick Esau, his brother. 
And so he did receive the double portion, but he was not ready for it yet. He had not grown in Christ yet, or, you know, in God yet. They didn't have, have, you didn't see Jesus in the Old Testament, this in a very overt way. But trust me, Jesus is always there. It's that red line of Jesus flows through the entire Bible, even the Old Testament. But Jacob was not ready to actually receive the inheritance. His dad gave it to him, but he had not received it yet. He had to run and hide. And because of what he had done, God had to put him through some trials. He ended up being tricked by his father-in-law. He ended up having to work seven extra years to pay for his bride that he loved so very much. He got tricked out of finances. He got tricked into marrying uh, the sister that he didn't want. He had a lot of payback, and he had a lot of trials and troubles to go through. But when it, uh, whenever he rested on that uh, rock who represented Jesus, he became aware of the Father's presence. Since this is a wonderful picture for us that resting on the rock leads to an open heaven and revelation of a father-son relationship. In our, in our case, the ladies as women, it would be our father-daughter relationship. Since Jacob began to find his identity in that resting place on a solid foundation, ladies, no matter what you're going through, no matter what you're struggling with, no matter what your situation is, even if everything is going great for you right now, trust me, it's not going to always be great. Life is just like that. There's so many things going on. We've all got the situations we're going through right now with the uh with the virus, you know, in here in 2020, we've got the virus issue and everybody's got something. We've got family issues. We've got uh, health issues. But when we rest on that solid foundation, that's whenever we learn who we are in Christ. So it was a glimpse of what was to, to come. He discovered that encounters come from places of rest, not striving. Angels, God's agents of provision, were ascending and descending over him. Jacob called this place Bethel because it was the house of God. And that's whenever he truly started realizing who his, well, what his identity was. And in uh, Hebrews, in the faith chapter, we see Jacob. Here's this guy with a deceiver, y'all. He was a deceiver. He was a conniver. He was a rascal. He, he was not someone that we would have picked out of the lineup to say, you know what, I think God's going to use him one day. God, he was not that kind of person at all. He was uh, selfish. He was living in chair too because he was living out of self. He was not living out of his identity in God. He was living out of his own identity and out of his selfishness and what he wanted. It didn't matter if it hurt his brother. It didn't matter if he disrespected his father. He wanted what he wanted and he wanted it now. And that's the kind of person that Jacob was. But we see here he is. We go all the way to the to the faith chapter in Hebrews in the New Testament, and guess who shows up? This old rascal Jacob is in the faith chapter. Why is he in there? He's in there because he he found out his identity. He found out, and it says here, Jacob worshipped in faith in, in faith's reality at the end of his life. And leaning upon his staff, he imparted a prophetic blessing upon each of Joseph's sons. So he was seeing that in uh, the spiritual realm that, that he should uh, bless Joseph's son. He was seeing with spiritual eyes at the end of his life, after he had been through all these trials and all these troubles, then that's whenever he realized, you know, he started to realize as he went through things. And I wanted to read this uh, much later. This is on page 207 in our book. It says, much later in the New Testament, the writer of Hebrews mentions three things about Jacob. That he blessed the sons of Joseph, he worshipped, and he leaned on his staff. What does this mean? I believe leaning on his staff represents rest. And that's one thing, that's one of the things we're learning. It says living and loving from a place of rest. That's, you know, that's what this book is about, ladies. We want to rest. We don't want to keep striving. We don't, here in Fresh Strength in our group, we don't want to see everybody just always living out of strife and out of fear. We want to see you move from chair two out of fear into chair one, which is the chair of faith. 
It says, uh, second, he built altars and worshiped. You will always see that in sons and daughters of inheritance, those seeking a blessing may worship God in order to get something, but mature, mature children of inheritance just worship God. We just worship him because we love him. We just worship him because that's what we do. We worship him out of our love. And finally, he crossed his arms to bless his grandsons, the sons of his beloved son, Joseph. Old and nearly blind, jo J Jacob could still see in the spirit. He blessed the younger before the older. He bypassed the natural because he saw into the supernatural. So the question of the day, ladies, are you a Jacob or are you an Israel? Um, are you an Elijah? or an Elisha. There was nothing wrong with Elijah. Elijah was, trust me, he was God's man. He didn't even die. I mean, but he, but Elisha did twice as many miracles because he proved that he would not leave the side of Elijah. Even though it was hard, he followed through and he did the hard thing. So do we want to prove ourselves? Do we want to be an Elisha? And we need to ask the question, do we want to be a Jacob? Remember, he was a Jacob, you know, the same person, but his, his character changed. He changed on the inside. He started out as a deceiver, but he ended up as an Israel. God changed his name because that's one thing that life talks about in the book. We, when you're in chair two, you, you judge people by their past. You look at them and you say, I can't trust you because you did this, and I'm not going to give you opportunity because you did that. But when we are in chair one and you are, you're confident in who you are in Christ, you're going to look at other people and you're going to see their destiny, not their history, not their past, but you're going to see their, their destiny. You're going to see what God can do with them, just like he did with Peter. He looked at Peter and Peter was just an old loud mouth and just always, you know, spouting off and getting in trouble and had anger issues. But God told him, I'm going to change your name to Peter because you're going to be a rock, and I'm going to build my church on you. And God changed him. He changed his name before he changed his character, and he did the same with Jacob. He changed his name from Jacob to Israel. It says, in the midst of a restless world, in your weariness and fatigue, can you find an unshakable rock to lay your head on? You'll find an open heaven there. Are you going through a wrestling match with God? You win by getting pinned, by surrender is the, and surrender is the place of exchange. When we surrender everything we're going through and everything we've done and everything that's happened to us. Ladies, we live in a mino world and a lot of things have happened to us that have made, maybe have made us frightened, has made us cynical, has made us not want to trust anybody. But even though there's no person on this earth that we can trust 100%, we can trust God. I mean, that's one thing I, I'd be willing to bet my life on. I have learned it, but I've learned it the hard way that I can trust God. It says, at that moment, you become an Israel. So do you want to be Jacob or do you want to be Israel? When you go into a hostile world, can you look into the faces and see the face of God? Has the change in your nature caused you to see others by their potential rather than by their past? When a restless world meets you, does it see someone who is at rest? Does it see a worshiper? Does it see a blessing, a blesser of supernatural beings? A generation today has started a wrestling match with God. If you have captured the face of God through intimacy, things are going to change. Your Esau's will embrace you rather than seek to harm you. The dove resting on you will change the environment around you. Out of your resting, you will receive and you will reign. Some will have to change their identity and their level of intimacy, but these will be the evidences. Wearing a robe of righteousness, a ring of authority, and sandals of peace, you will walk under an open heaven. You will buy you your inheritance, steward it, multiply it, and gain authority. That is the invitation for sons and daughters in this season. And if you accept it, the world will change. Ladies, the world might not change around you, but the world can change in you. You'll see the world differently. And that was the thing was Elisha had proven that he would steward 
he would take care of the anointing, the same anointing that Elijah had. God gave him that anointing because he had proven that he would uh, steward it well, that he would cherish it. Something that's cost you a lot, you're going to cherish and you're going to uh, treasure it and you're going to take care of it. Anything that costs you anything, even if it's in the physical, if you spend, you know, if you spend a half a million dollars on a diamond, you would really take super, super good care of that because you've invested a lot into it. So anything that you have been invested in, anything that you have invested tears and uh, time and, and, and crying and all these things that you have invested these things in, that you have given back to God, you will steward it and you will be faithful with it. And that's my um, admonishment to you today. I just want to ask each one of you ladies to be faithful because we can be faithful even when it's not easy. Even when there's things going on all around us, there's all kind of chaos around us, that we can still be faithful. And when, when we are faithful and when we um, do the things that God has required of us, and when we move out of chair two, that's what God did. He moved Jacob out of chair two. He belonged to God already, but he changed Jacob and he made him into Israel. So that's what I, the question for today. I'd just like you to ask as you go about your day, as you, and if you find yourself, you know, situations that are causing you to be fearful or causing you to have doubt, then you're going to recognize it more. And I think this, this book is helping me to do that and even recognize it in other people and not be so judgmental just to say, you know, I want to help them get out of chair too and help them you know, see the life that's available to them in chair one. And ladies, it's it's a beautiful life to live in chair one. You do live in rest and you do have peace. And so that's my prayer for you today. And that's what I want to leave you with. I thank each and every one of you. Thank you for this time. And I do want to leave you right now with a prayer asking that you will walk in peace and that you will walk in faith today. So, Father, I just ask that today. I speak a blessing over each and every person that will hear this message. And, Father God, I just ask that each person that has heard it, Father God, will walk in blessing, that they will walk in peace, they will walk in justice, they will walk in mercy, they will walk in grace, and they will walk in uh, a new identity of who they are, and they will find that resting place on the rock, Father. And Father, I just ask that. I just uh, speak it out over each and every lady here. And we just give you praise, glory, and honor for all these things. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, ladies, for your time. Have a great day.